Good morning. Um, great for all of you to be here today. Why don't we go ahead and open uh, our service with uh, prayer, and we will get started. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we are we have the opportunity, the privilege to be able to come and worship you. Lord, we pray that in these uh, next few moments that you would be glorified, um, Lord, that you would uh, inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, may you open our hearts and our minds to um, see you for who you truly are, to understand what your word tells us, that we would reflect together upon your goodness and your grace. We thank you for Christ, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand as we sing unto the Lord. Jesus, 
Oh, oh, there. That's because I didn't turn the mic on. <laughs> Good thing that was just the introduction. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to understand the scripture, that as we um, open it together, you would teach us and speak to us. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to understand your scripture. Lord, I pray for all of us here that we'd have a unity of faith and love, that you would humble our hearts, that we would be able to understand what you have to say to us today. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. So we see this train of thought of God has called us to a life of humility with an eternal focus in mind. So let's go ahead and look at Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 12 and 13, just for us to understand what's going on here. We're going to go verse by verse. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. So what I want us to see is that this is a continuation of an argument that he started in the beginning of chapter 2. In, in, in the beginning of chapter 2, in verses 1 to 4, he explains something to us. And here's why I know that there is a continuation. Okay? Look, at verse 12, uh, look at verse 12. It says, therefore. Okay? So whenever you see a therefore, it's a, it's, a, it's a clue, it's a signal to us that he is referring to something before. So we always, in seminary, they would say, when you see a therefore, always ask the question, what is it there for? So what we see is this argument that begins in verse 1. And we see in verses 1 to 4, Paul is telling us, because of our common experience with Jesus, let us all pursue humility and serving others, that we do nothing from rivalry or, or conceit, 
but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And then in verses 5 to 11, we see Christ is our example. Jesus, is, he says, now, because I've called you to this common um, uh, attitude and world focus of humility and service to others, look at Jesus, look at how he did it. And now we find in verses 12 to 18, uh, a further explanation, a further argument of what that is to be. In verses 12 to 13, he says this, humble servant-hearted service to others is the life of faith. So here's how that breaks down. Look at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, so he's saying therefore, so therefore of everything that we've read, now consider these things as you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. When he says work out your salvation, he's thus, he's directly referring to what everything that he's been talking about previously. So what has, has Paul been calling us to? Look, look at verse uh, 3 and 4. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Okay, so we see that is what he's calling us to. In verses 5 to 11, he's then saying, now Christ did it, therefore we should look to Christ. And now in verses 12 and 13, he's saying, this is the life of faith. A life of faith is one that we pursue humility and service to others. That is what the life of faith looks like. That is what working out our salvation is. To say that working out your salvation is only an intellectual pursuit or uh, an obedience pursuit. I'm looking at all the things that I'm doing, Jesus. Look at all the things that I've done. Look at the places that I've served. Look at the money that I've given. Look at the ministries that I'm a part of. Those are all good and worthy things. But at the heart of that, at the heart of a pursuit of a life of faith is verses 3 and 4. So when he refers to work out your salvation in fear and trembling, he's directly referring to verses 3 and 4. So that's, that's the first aspect of this part of the verse. But the second thing, he says something very curious. Look at the end of verse 12. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How do you and I work out our salvation with fear and trembling? What is he referring to? Are we, are we to be afraid? Like literally afraid? Well, here's what I want us to understand. The words that Paul, are, Paul is using is really is having a proper sense of awe and wonder of God. Think about, think about what was just written before these verses. So look at verses 9 to 11 with me. It's not going to be on your screen, but just look at it. In verses 9 to 11, he gives us this picture of Jesus, where Jesus is, is uh, standing there, and every knee and tongue, every knee shall bow, and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even Satan himself and the demons and all the, the worldly powers, the evil powers that are here on this earth, will one day have to bow before Christ and say, you are Lord. And then he says, now work out your salvation in fear and trembling, that we, we have a proper understanding of our salvation, that we would not think of things of, well, my pursuit of, of holiness, my life is just whatever. I'm just going to cruise through life. That's a danger that we face here, especially in the West, but even more so in Hawaii, where we just kind of, we don't want to rock the boat, we, so we're just going to kind of live our lives. And what Paul is saying here is when we think about our, our relationship with Jesus and becoming like him, Let's not be glib about it. Let's not be apathetic about it. Let us understand that, that we are serving the king of kings. That there, there's not a single power, there's not a single uh, spiritual power or worldly power that will not bend the knee to Jesus and utter that he is Lord. So these verses are really a remember who you serve. Remember who lives inside of you. We don't serve some weak king. We don't serve a nation, an ethnicity, a re region, or planet. We serve the sovereign king of all creation. Not only that, but he now lives inside of us, who empowers us to do all that he has called us to do. So if, if, we're, being, um, if we're looking at verses 12 and 13, one of the things I want us to really understand here in verses 12 to 13 is that, G that Paul is saying 
not only is this life of, of humility and service to others something that is called to, that Christ has called, has led as example, but also, look at verse 13. Let us think about the God of the universe, the sovereign king of the universe who now lives inside of us. Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Not only do you serve, have this great example, but also the king of kings and the Lord of lords now resides in you. We have no excuses anymore to say, well, that's just for the super Christians. I don't need to do that. I can just live my life and do what I want and pursue the pleasures and the pursuits that I want and I will go to church and, and do this and, and, and serve but never sacrifice. And what Paul is saying here, that is not to be so. We are all called to walk a life of submission, obedience, humility, and suffering for the sake of our King. Because look at verse 13. He's saying not only is the Spirit of God living inside of you, but he says he is working in you both to will, to work for his good pleasure. He works in both our will and our ability. God has not called us to anything that Jesus hasn't done himself. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't empower us to do. In our own strength, we cannot do anything. We lack the will and the strength to do any more righteous things empowered by a moral righteousness. See, here's the, the beautiful thing. In the flesh, we cannot do anything to please God. But then in, when we become God's children, it, through faith, he grants us this, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, not only do I, oh, I want you to, to glorify me, and then he says, not only, do you, uh, not only am I calling you to this, but I'm going to empower you to do it. So here's the thing. You and I, we have no excuses to say, I can't do that. I can't submit that way. I can't be that kind of person. I'm just this, or I'm, I'm too weak, or I'm too afraid, or I'm too proud. I'm too, th all these things. There is no excuse anymore in the kingdom of God because we have an example in Christ. We have a calling in verses 3 and 4. We have in verse 12 to 13 now a realization that we have the most powerful being in the universe in whom has called us and said, you will follow and serve me, and now I also, he's empowering and living inside of us. This verse is telling us that God works in us, both to give us a desire to do righteousness and the power to actually do it. But here's an important question for us. That's great to know. If I have a, the power to obey, then why don't I? If the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the, the, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and he says that he's working both to will and to work out my salvation, then why is it that I struggle with the will to serve him? Why is it that I struggle with the will to want to, to, to submit my life to him? And I would like for you to look with me at James chapter 4. It's going to be on the screen, uh, but in James chapter 4, it gives us a hint of why we struggle, why we struggle. James 4, verses 1 to 10. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people do not know, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Y you hear what he's saying here? He lists in verses um, 1 to uh, verse 4 all these these desires and attitudes and sinful hearts 
that we, uh, even as God's people, possess. And then he says something very important. He gives us an outline of what we must do to destroy those desires. Verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then in verse 10, he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So what does this mean? Let's go back to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we see, um, he's saying, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So the question that we're dealing with is, if God's spirit is dwelling in me and empower me, why am I, do I feel powerless to actually accomplish what he is calling me to do? And what I would say is, the problem is not with God's power, it is with our pride. According to, to James chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, the thing that is, is preventing us from finding joy in Christ, the thing that is preventing us from walking with him and to know his power and to defeat sin is that we are resisting humbling ourselves. So what we see here in these verses, specifically verses 7 and 10, I'll read it again. I think it's going to be on your screen. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be torn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So are you struggling with anger, anxiety, fear, lust, bitterness? Maybe God's calling you to go or to stay or even serve in a certain way, but you don't want to and you feel stuck. You feel angry that certain people, uh, whether it's at work or whether it's, it's family members or at the church, whatever it may be, that you can't get over this hump. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's a fear of certain things that you cannot walk in obedience because you're fearful of the results. And what I would say is all those things find their solution in James 4, 1 to 10, very specifically verses 7 to 10. God is calling us to submit and humble ourselves to him. When we submit and humble our hearts to the Lord, verse 13 becomes so clear. When we say, God, I'm weak, I am poor, I am wretched. Lord, I'm, I wanna, I'm humbling myself before you. Where you want me to go, who you want me to be, what you want me to dream, I will do. Lord, let me desire to do your will and your will alone. Let your joys be my pursuits. Verse 13 begins to take place in our hearts. But what is key is, will you humble your hearts that God may be found to be your great joy and you may find rest in that. St. Augustine said uh, specifically about humility, should you ask me what is the first thing in religion, I should reply that the first, the second, and the third thing therein lies humility. If you see verses 7 to 10, um, um, you look at in, uh, in, in James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, I don't know if it's going to be on a screen, um, but he, he says, hey, submit yourselves to God and then in verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, take your, take your scriptures and look at Philippians chapter 2. I want you to look vo at um, verses 5 to 11. I'm not going to read it completely, but I just want us to look at it. I want you to look at it. You see Christ humble himself by taking the form of a servant, even to the point of death. That's what the, it is, right? He says in verse 8, and he's being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So what we see in verse, in, in James 4, 7 to 10, is this, is this idea that if we would humble ourselves, we would find joy in Christ's exaltation, and we one day will also be exalted. See, we're not living for the wins, the satisfactions on this world. We're living for an eternal glorification that we will one day walk with Christ. So what we see here 
in Philippians all the way from 12, from verses 1 to 13, is he has laid out this call for us to walk in humility. In verses 12 and 13, he is now saying, you have no excuse. There is joy, there is hope, there is power for us to pursue humility and service to one another. But he goes further. Look with me at verses 14 to 18. In verse Philippians 2, verse 14, he says, Do all things well, grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Here's a second aspect of this. Our attitude matters. Our attitude matters in our Christian growth. I think I've mentioned this before, but I can vividly remember when I was younger, like, uh, my parents calling me to do something and said, so either you do it or here's the consequences. Grounding, restrictions. And so I would do it, but I wouldn't do it with a heart of love. I would do it with a heart full of resentment. My lips would be filled with grumbling and dissension. And what we see in verses 14 to 18 is Paul is not simply saying that we must humble ourselves and serve others, but our attitude in doing those things is important. You see, our attitude proceeds from our true treasure. What our, our, what our treasure is in this life, when it's taken from us, we tend to grumble and voice it. So you can always tell where someone's treasure lies by what they grumble about, what they get angry about. Our treasure lies and seeks to blame, we, we seek to blame someone for, or something for taking from us or from what we're lacking. What we grumble about or argue reveals where we are putting our trust and our hope in. So look at verses 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In Deuteronomy 32.5, this is Paul's directly alluding to the story of the Israelites wandering through the desert for 40 years. That's so he, this, this idea of um, uh, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. He's referring to Deuteronomy 32.5. And, po and Moses is talking about the nation of Israel, and God has provided over and over for them. And all they can do is grumble and complain about what God has not provided for them, whether it's food or water. You think, think about the people of Israel okay, during that time. They saw all the plagues happen. They walked on dry land through the Red Sea. God provides them water when they needed it by turning a bitter water source into a sweet. They start to complain about food, and he sends manna from heaven. But yet, every step of the way, all they can do is say, we, you know what, it was better when we were slaves in Egypt, because at least we were, our bellies were full. Now we don't have it. And Moses, you just brought us out here to die. You and God brought us out here to die. You're conspiring together. Their hearts were full of bitterness because what they longed for was for their bellies to be full rather than to go to the promised land that God has promised them. The people of God grumbled and complained, revealing where their treasure was. In Exodus chapter 15, after two months of walking in the desert, the people are hungry. They've seen God do amazing things, but then they look at, and they're starting to get hungry two and a half months into it, and they say, if only we had died by the hands of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Their complaining revealed their disrespect for God, that they didn't desire to be in his presence and walk with him and to follow him. They just didn't want to suffer. 
They just didn't want to walk through the desert. So they complained and wished that they were dead. But what their complaining revealed was that they didn't trust God and they preferred slavery over freedom. Their bellies to be full over a pursuit of the promised land. Scott Hubbard wrote this, The object of our cravings need not be evil. Often it isn't. The Israelites, for example, reach for pleasures quite harmless in themselves. Food and water in Exodus 15 and 16 and 17. A safe passage to the promised land, Numbers chapter 14. They long for comfort in Numbers 16, but their desires for their good things somehow turned to bad. They wanted them sooner than God chose to give them. They wanted them more than God himself. So too with us. We want a relaxing evening at home, but we get a call from a friend who needs help moving. We want a job that feels meaningful, but we get stuck among spreadsheets. Or more significantly, we want the future we planned for, but we get one we never wanted. We grumble because we have diligently listened to a voice other than the Lord, our God. And have begun to repeat the words. Instead of crying out to God, help me trust you, you are good, we mutter and spill and vent. The equivalent of saying, God, your ways are not good. So what verses 14 and 15 show us is that every Christian is called to live in a way that communicates our treasure is not of this world. You may think that grumbling and uh, questioning or dissenting is one of those little white sins that, well, we don't need to worry about that. Because oftentimes, uh, and it seems like in our culture, that's kind of an American pastime at this point. Grumbling and dissenting, arguing with one another. But what God has called us to do is that our treasure would be in Christ alone. Our, our focus would be on what is to come, not what we can gain today. And, we're sa- and he's saying, let that color your hopes and your dreams, but also do not mutter and utter words that communicate that your treasure is somehow in this world. By grumbling. You see, when we refuse to gossip and talk stink about our bosses, we reveal we have another boss and another treasure. When we refuse to grumble about our state and our culture, and our state about whatever it may be, we're saying, but I'm longing for a kingdom to come. My treasure, my hope is in Christ alone. I'm not living for this world, I'm living for the next. You see, God intends us to be, dis- to be st- distinct from this world, not by what we're against, our arguments, or our music, or boycotts, but that we as God's people would individually live lives of normal, everyday Christians who are committed to living with their eyes focused on a kingdom to come, their hearts and their hopes on Christ alone, that shows that we belong to a different kingdom. When we grumble and complain about this world and what we have or don't have, what we're saying is, I really want this world. You see, this is the great calling of the church, that we would act and resemble a people whose kingdom is not of this world. Look at verse 16 with me. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your life, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Our holding fast, our, our striving to be humble and servant-hearted, our, our refusal to grumble or complain, actually not only makes a great example to the world abroad, but also to us, to one another. See, look at verses 16 and to 18. What Paul is saying here is that by them holding fast to Jesus and a commitment to live this life, Strive for humility, strive for service, strive for re- rejecting, hu- grumbling, or complaining, seeking unity in the church. It actually brings him joy, it brings him comfort. What he's telling them is what brings me joy is that on the day when we stand before Christ and you are vindicated and brought into his kingdom, I will be filled with joy and I will boast that God allowed me, Paul, to have a small role in you being a part of the kingdom. He's looking forward to that day and boasting of their faithfulness. That's not a selfish thing. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, so here's the the logic, okay? He's he's telling them, guys, 
I want you to keep serving Christ. I want you to keep becoming more like him because there's going to come a day. I'm, look, this is my hope. This is my dream for you. He's like, I'm not dreaming for you to have all the things in this world. I'm not dreaming and hoping that you will be uh, amazing and kill it on this earth because you're being persecuted for your faith. My hope and my dream is that when we stand before Christ on that day and he says, and he tells you, welcome my, good, my faithful, good and faithful servant and lets you into the kingdom, I'm going to have this pride to say, God, let you, you let me have a small part in them walking into the kingdom. He's saying, that's, that's my joy. That's my hope for you. It's not to, for you to, to gain degrees and positions and power in this world, but for one day when we stand before Christ and he says, come in, I'm going to have this joy that says, I always played a small part. But look at verse 17. He says this, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Think about that. This is, this is not someone who's saying, I, I want you to do good so I feel good. He's saying, even if I have to die, even if I'm killed for your sake, then I rejoice because I'm going to get to stand on that day and see you walk into the kingdom. And that brings me great joy. And I can get a little glimpse of that when I think about my children. That even if, whatever it means, even if I have to, whatever that means, my heart is like, I want to see my kids walk into the kingdom. I want to be able to meet, see them in the kingdom and, re, and rejoice with them in the day when we are all in the kingdom together. And so Paul, with this, this heart full of joy, is saying the same thing for these people. Even if it means his death. Look at verse 18. And then he says this, Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This walk of faith is not one of doldrums and ho humness where we pursue to be, obey God apart from joy. The thing that powers our walk in faith, our humbling ourselves and serving others, is not so that we, God will say, oh, well, you did a good job, I'm going to let you into the kingdom. Our, our, our service and our humility is that we are is empowered by a heart that says, I want more joy in Christ. I want more joy in knowing him and becoming like him. That is what Paul is getting at here. And that is my plea for you, that you would not base your faith upon simply doing what is right, but that you would place your, your faith in, I'm pursuing Christ because he is worthy. There is more joy to be found and to know him and to become like him than anything in this world. And whatever that means, whatever that calls me to, however, that, however it may look, I want to be with you, Jesus. Lastly, so where does that leave us? I just got some questions for us. Do you have an eternal focus? When you endure losses, are you focusing on Jesus' ultimate victory or what you have lost? Number two, when you are weary of doing good for your fellow church member, are you remembering that one day you will rejoice that God allowed you to be a small part in their endurance or rescue? Let's say you have a brother or sister in the Lord that you're struggling with. Struggling to love them, to accept them. Maybe you should be doing what Paul is saying. Think about that day of judgment when they walk through, when, the, when Christ utters to them, well done, my good and faithful servant, come into this kingdom. Think about that. That somehow, in some way, God is using you to help them endure. God is using you to sanctify them in the truth. God is using you to help them get to that place. Number three, when you're striving to humble yourselves, are you remembering that the eternal king of all creation lives inside of you and has called you to serve in joy? So as we think about all these things, as we question it, what I want us to understand is this life of faith is definitely a hard one. But it is not one that is empowered by a fear of God's rejection, but it is empowered by, a, by Christ who has already accomplished it all for us. And our pursuit is not a pursuit of approval, but a pursuit of joy because we already have his approval. So let us humble ourselves, let us serve one another, let us refuse to grumble and complain so that others may see the great God whom we serve. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means to walk in humility, to serve one another, to strive for uh, uh, rejecting grumbling or dissension or arguing, but that we would be a people who are motivated and empowered to serve you because we are pursuing joy in you. Lord, I pray that you would humble our hearts, that we would not be people who are thinking about, well, what about me and my stuff? What about me and what I get out of this? Lord, help us to reject that thought and pursue you with all our hearts. Lord, I thank you for Christ. Lord, I pray that he would be magnified in our lives, that we would see and savor Christ, that we would sacrificially give of ourselves so that others may see the same. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. While we go ahead and stand as we sing a song of response. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Here of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest i in my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Father, I pray that you would remind us of your goodness and your grace. Lord, that we would remember that we trust in you. That you are good and you are faithful. That your ways are higher than our ways. That what you intend for us is good. For our good, your glory. All right when we look at this world and what's going on, it's hard for us to make sense of it and what you're doing. But you have called us to cling to the truth to Scripture. You've called us to humble our hearts and submit our lives to you. You've called us to pursue joy in you. And Lord, it's, I realize that it's not easy, it's hard. But you've said that this is the life of faith. Lord, I pray that we would be a distinct people who are seeking to find our joy not in the things of this world, but in you alone and what you have done for us and who you are and what you've promised for us in our future. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become a a distinct people who live life differently. 
who interact with one another and with this world radically different than the, what the world tells us to do. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move among us, create in us a new heart. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I thank you for coming today. We pray that you, God would richly bless you and, and, and speak to you this week. We pray that you have a great week in the Lord. Have a great week. God bless. Thank you.